This is Smart Investing with Mike Rand. Securities and advisory service offered through KMS Financial Services. This is Smart Investing with Michael J. Rand. With Michael's producer, Chris Martin. You can email us your questions. Go to smartinvestingshow.com to see how. For I have the pride, the privilege, nay, the pleasure of introducing to you the one, the only. This is Smart Investing with Mike Rand. Hello again, everybody. Thank you for booting up another episode of The Smart Investing Show. I'm Mike Wren, your host. Across the table from me, like usual, is Mr. Chris Martin. This is the podcast where we try to take the topic of investing. Number one, we try to make it easier to understand. Number two, we try to get you good, relevant information on each and every show. Thirdly, we try to be entertaining and like I, Chris and I were talking just for a moment before the show, I think we can add a fourth bullet, bullet point. Uh, we try to be brief. <laughs> True. I was telling Chris that uh, when we're doing this podcast and in the podcast world, we're truly nobodies. And that's okay because being popular doesn't necessarily mean that you're good. It just means that you're popular. Well, we're definitely not popular. We're growing in popularity by ones and twos, but still. Well, we're not we're not beholden to anybody. Exactly. This stock tip brought to you by Kenmore. And we're not beholden to ourselves, really. We're not so full of ourselves that we think that somebody in the world would like to listen to a three hour podcast split into two minute thirty episodes. Now speak for yourself. I mean, there. I started thinking about uh, we uh, a couple of weeks ago. My broker dealer had its normal meetings. And I went over there. I usually don't go over, but I went over this time. And I blindly checked some boxes of some lectures that I wanted to go to. Mm. I didn't read carefully enough, mistake on me, that the first lecture that I signed up for was three hours in length. I'm not a neurosurgeon. There's nothing that takes three hours to explain to me. Unless it was something that I didn't know anything about. Was it multiple speakers or just one guy? Oh, no. You're talking one. Oh. And, I, and I, it, was, it was a client relationship management software system. So it was about as boring. It was like having somebody read Funkin' Wagnall's encyclopedia oh. to you. So 30 minutes, I was out. I was the very first thing. <laughs> you know, and we're going to be taking our first break. And I was packing up my stuff, you know, mm-hmm. another, but I usually use a four-letter word. Packing up my stuff and getting ready to leave. And I looked at my little uh, thingy mabobber that tells me. Your schedule? That, yeah, the schedule is so big that you can download an app on the phone for when they have these get together. So I looked at it, and I'll be damned if the second one wasn't three hours. Oh. I didn't even bother going into the room. Blanche, they got me for three hours. I'm barely going to be able Seriously, to cram all that I don't, info in. W- unless you're in some lab or doing surgery. Well, like what? A, um, or a military exercise. Yeah, I mean, what? What in the world? What? How? What do people think? What you just have time to burn? And I realized there's nothing that I could do. I could drug people, give them a drug that that would make them think that I was interesting. Even in that scenario, I would not think that drug would last three hours. Not three hours? No. I, to to make it nerdy. I'm going to San Diego Comic Con soon. Yeah, they open up the giant halls and convention things. They have movie trailers and everything. None of those panels last three hours, and they have multiple celebrities that are entertaining. Yeah, and, and do an hour, and then they're like, and we're out. Probably, I dare I say, nice to look at. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I not not a lot of uh, male models at the. Uh, the... I am not nice to look at. I mean, some of the podcast people out there that are famous, like I mentioned, Adam Carolla and even Lance Armstrong, they're not nice to look at. They're just there. No. You know? Look at the top podcasters, Bill Burr, Joe Rogan. You wouldn't want to stare at them for three hours. No, and Bill Burr Burr and Joe Rogan, I hate to say it, they cannot carry off three hours. It's impossible. They, They have little fits of wonder in the first hour and a half, but... When you're listening to anybody for that long, it's droning. And I was telling Chris before we started this podcast, I said, maybe the fact that you and I were on the air for 12 years makes a difference. Because we know, being in AM radio, Chris and I know what bad is. Oh, yeah. You know, those infomercials, clean out your colon for 40 minutes (gasps) in a row. (laughs) 
<laughs> I can't believe that they would play that on the air. And there was another guy that, you know, I won't mention, but yeah, we talked about that was Mike uh, uh, after first us. name. Yeah, no, the first name is Mike, last name is Ren or no, is it something no, no. else? <laughs> <laughs> As his first name was, uh, uh, no, his second name was a comic book, what do you call it, onomatopoeia, <laughs> one of those really? Biff, pow, things, oh. and whew, that was, I had to stay in there for a half hour and listen to it. Oh, I remember. Yeah. You, he told you to take out all the pauses or all the thes. Take or... out all the uhs. <laughs> for an hour show, I had to go in and take out all the uhs. Was the office on the air then? Because that is something that Michael would want somebody yeah, to do. Yeah, take that out was all, exactly. Take out all the and Oz. change the inflection. Can you change the inflection in my voice? No, this is not CSI. <laughs> I'm not going to enhance, enhance, <laughs> enhance. So anyway, Chris and I always try to be brief. Uh, some usually or most of the time, I think that we'd like to catch ourselves when I'm talking slowly, where I'm not varying my speech cadence, where I'm not trying to keep your attention. Hopefully, I'm aware of that most of the time. Chris and I, gets that thousand yard stare. Yeah, and hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, um, hopefully, we catch ourselves enough that that this uh, podcast is actually listenable for the for the brief amount of time that we try to do it in. On today's show, what I'm going to try to talk about is uh, I'm going to, I've, I've actually wrote down some numbers and found some numbers of the markets that just can kind of highlight the, the craziness that always is. I kind of ignore this stuff, so I lose touch of what people are focusing on because what I focus on is nothing of what the public focuses on. But here's what the public focuses on. May 3rd. S&P 500 closed at 2,946. One month later, on June 3rd, it closed at 2,733.69. That's down 7.2%. And for some people, that's a big deal. I have, I have clients that will call me where they say, well, my statement was down. Uh, okay. It's, it's almost, it's so... Not in my thinking. They might as well be uh, calling me and saying, when I was driving home, my car made a noise. <laughs> yeah, but that would be that would get you interested. No. Because <laughs> you're the car guy. Really? What kind of Actually, noise? <laughs> no. Even, the, even that is, oh, just okay. as, is just as meaningless as somebody saying that their statement. And they have such an indignant tone to their voice that I start thinking, well, hell, maybe something went wrong. Nothing ever went wrong. There's never a computer glitch that, mm -hmm. you know, it's just somebody, it's just a human being being, uh, needing reassurance. Mm -hmm. Something happened. I never really think that it's just the statement. I think it's probably a cavalcade of things. Something else going on. Yeah, like two, three, four things and, oh, you know, and then, then this happened. Yeah. It was like I get I'm always the one that I think I feel anyway that I get the final straw calls. That's the final straw. Now my statement's down. <laughs> my uh, my I told you my boy doesn't uh, he invested in something. I'm not going to tell you what cuz then you'll go, "Oh, Chris." No, I don't be, care. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh but I mean, I care, but not I mean, not in that well, way. Well, he's in he's in, you know, new generation kid, so he invested in a, in a Bitcoin. Oh, okay. Uh, I see. I yeah, well, but, I hope it's okay. I mean, uh, it, it hardly ever works out. But he came over to the house because it was his birthday last week, and twice during the two hours that he was there, he looked at his phone to see if it had risen or fallen. Oh, I'm like, that's not dude, good. There's a dude that's <laughs> going to drive you mad. Just yeah. don't look at it. I told him, I said, take whatever app you're using, uninstall it for a week and then yeah. just reinstall it that way you can't look at it all the time but yeah he was doing that thing where well oh, hold up. on oh. here everybody hold on here mary did did you the listener catch that chris just gave some sage albeit wise advice to his son about psychology sun shines on a dog's butt at least once a day <laughs> You know, I don't really like that saying. You're going to have to come up with another one. <laughs> it's too real. It's, it's, okay. <laughs> Chris just gave the same advice that I give to multi-million dollar clients. Hey, I learned something from this show. Oh, my God. Wow. <laughs> but I, I learned it from you because I see your face. When, when you tell me these stories, oh, there's just nothing. There's nothing. Stop. Stop looking at it. 
<laughs> okay, so anyway, let me continue with my notes here. So, uh, so that's down seven point two percent. And last last Christmas time, I was really kind of only half half assed aware of this that on Christmas Eve was the low point of the S and P five hundred being down nineteen point eight percent. And then from Christmas Eve to April 23rd, it shot up and broke, hit a new high. And then, it, what is that? Oh, wow. That, I love that. So we should like have that. In, <laughs> we should have that to start before I say something, you know, it's enlightening. Kind of drain. <laughs> so anyway, you know, we, we have a huge low, a, a, a huge low to everybody else out there. 19.8% down on Christmas Eve 2018. Then May 3rd, 2019, we're up. And then a month later, we're down. Okay? That's normal. I've gotten used to it. I realize that every single client that I have probably hasn't gotten to gotten used to it or most. And the only thing that I can refer to is Warren Buffett's professor, Benjamin Graham. If you read, um, I think that, gosh, the title of the book is, man, old man, old man brain right now. I think it's called Security Analysis. I thought that was going to be the title of no, 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 old man. <laughs> no, that'd be the title of my book. <laughs> so anyway, the Security Analysis. Benjamin Graham wrote it. Look it up. Benjamin Graham came up with an idea where he calls the stock market Mr. Market because his idea through the whole book is... Well, there's more than one idea. There's the ideas of how to look at companies based on book value. Some of that works today. I will admit that some of it doesn't work today because how a person does business or how a company does business today is different than when the book was written. Case in point, somebody like an Amazon doesn't invest in brick and mortar. Okay, They invest their money in other ways, and it tends to be that they need less money to get a business going if it's based on the internet. You would you can okay. you can see okay. that. Yeah. And you're not trying to build a brick and mortar store in every city like an old Sears. Mm-hmm. You're trying to build, you know, mail order yeah. for lack of a better word. And it is cheaper to do that. It requires less capital. Well, that has happened in a lot of ways. Because the computer chip and processing power has become larger and more efficient, Typically, a company can get by with using less capital. And that means a company becomes can become more profitable than they used to be at the turn of, the, of a century ago. A hundred years ago, that wasn't the case. So even though this book isn't that old, there have been some changes. So when you're reading this book, and I am assuming that all of you are nerds out there and just going to rush out and get this very, very thick book... It's a big deal because it's very, very easy to follow. The math in it is extraordinarily easy. But I believe it was chapter 7 or chapter 9 where it really gets to the meat of the matter. And that is that is the emotions where he calls the stock market Mr. Market. And Mr. Market behaves like a manic depressive. And he goes in there. This is a very big simplification. But imagine you ran, let's just say, something that's easy to figure out, easy to understand, a 7-Eleven. And Mr. Market comes in through the door each and every day as a, as a crazy person and offers you money to buy the 7-Eleven. And because the person's a manic depressive, anything's going to set them off. So if they get up late and they have a flat flat tire and so on, Mr. Market's going to be in a bad mood. He's going to come through the doors of your 7-Eleven and probably offer you an amount for your store that you know is well below what it's worth. You know, you would never take it in a million years. Mm -hmm. A few weeks, months go by, Mr. Market found new prescription drugs, bought a new car, blah, 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 you know, has the love of his life. And all of a sudden he walks through the door. We're assuming it's a man, by the way. Uh, 
<laughs> walks through this. <laughs> this whole scenario just feels like some kind of foreign independent film. Or oh, yeah. Brad Pitt walks in with a fedora. No, no. Actually, yeah. he's the stock market. We could actually make a film like that and probably do pretty well what and you just said. call it Mr. Market. Yeah. So Brad Pitt walks through the door with the fedora in a really good mood and offers you the moon for your 7-Eleven. Offers you an, an amount that you know that... You, it would take you five years of running the Seven Eleven normally to equal the amount that he just paid you, that he's willing to pay you. That's what the stock market is. the The stocks of these companies are volatile. The companies aren't so volatile. There are quite a few newsletters that I read out there, and they they talk about they do some good and some bad. The good is, is they talk about the indexes usually because it's quote unquote safe for them to talk about the indexes. And they say, how can 500 or 505 companies of the S&P 500 index be as volatile as Trump's tweets? Well, they're not. And we know that pretty much anything can happen on a tweet. There was a man that was a trader on uh, Wall Street. His name was Art Cashin. And he said, we're one tweet away from a rally. And basically, in my opinion, we're kind of one tweet away from kind of anything well, for about it, 90 minutes. What does he mean, rally? Like a Oh, it was, he, it was a quote that he made when the market was going down. Uh, oh, okay. You know, uh, on so he a trade mean like one, a gathering of people. Yeah, yeah he, <laughs> he's one of those reporters on CNBC that would be mm-hmm. talking from the floor. He's since passed away. Oh, okay. And he made the comment, well, we're just one tweet away from an actual rally turning. Oh, you know, okay, things are down. It. But if somebody would tweet something, it would go up. And it's, <laughs> Wink, wink. Nudge, yeah, nudge. yeah, and it's been that way since the 1700s when the Wall Street got its start. It's never changed. And so... You have these newsletters talking about, you know, how can 500 companies be as volatile as the market going up and down? Well, they're not. Well, what's the disconnect then? Well, the disconnect is, is you have the company and then you have the common stock of the company. The company, if you go see the company itself, if you're visiting inside a Costco, if you're inside a Fred Meyers, if you're inside a Walmart, okay, you go in that company Every day for a year, how much change are you going to see? Well, you're going to see different merchandising for the different seasons. But other than that, I would submit to you, other than there being snow and really, really hot, I don't think you're going to see much change, okay? Now what I would like you to do is every day look at the stock price of those companies for a year and see how volatile it is. That's what most people concentrate on. That slip of paper that you can't see or touch, for some reason, they make some big disconnect and they don't, they forget that there's an actual bona fide company behind that that they should be looking at. Like when you buy, when you buy property on Monopoly, you, you're very well aware that when somebody lands on your boardwalk or park place that you're going to typically get a big payment, especially if you develop it, Okay. When you, Monopoly is very real. You know, you're, you're, you're looking at the properties and you know what they're worth because you know the revenue that you're going to get from them, from, from people landing on them. And so, you know, the value stays more constant. But the human beings, when they see, when they see the prices that are happening in the market, they never, and I'm re- I really mean the word never. They never make the correlation that there's an actual company behind there that its profits and earnings are almost never as volatile is what's going on in the market because the prices are being swayed by President Trump's tweets, somebody else's tweets, the Federal Reserve, the government. They're being swayed this way and that from day to day to day, and none of it matters so much. But to some people, it kind of does. And for some reason, most of the folks in the world concentrate on the slips of paper being traded back and forth than rather what that company might be worth to them as an investor today. And very much more importantly, what that company might be worth in a decade from now. Because if we, the best way to do that is roll back 10, 20 years. Look at all of these different companies Uh, Let's just say Costco, Starbucks, McDonald's, Walmart. Roll everything back 10, 20 years. Let's not even say that the stock price has gone up. Let's just say the companies have come out with ideas to where 
you would rather shop with them today than you do, than you would 10 years ago. Let's say McDonald's drive-through. Most of them have two drive-throughs where you can get through quicker. Let's not even try to make the correlation that that might make them more profitable. Let's just make the correlation that, yeah, I would rather... Just get your food faster. Yeah, I'd rather get my food faster. Somebody like you, you might say that you wish the McRib was on there more often than it is now. Why isn't it? <laughs> and why does why does Taco Bell continually fight having just Mexi fries? There's a lot of fast food questions I have, so let's not go there. <laughs> okay. But anyway, I guess you can see my point is if, you know, I... I think I remember more than 10 years ago, Walmart's produce did not look like Walmart's produce of today. It looks pretty mm. good today. Pretty good and fresh. I, no? work, I, I work with produce, so I will say, uh, it's, I guess it's better. Okay. Uh, I, I have that feeling. I'm not, it's not based on anything. I think they have to have it better. Okay. At, I just, I think, I think these companies have improved their game. Okay. Starbucks, I mean, I'm not sure if it's an improvement because I don't partake in all their sugary drinks, but oh my gosh. And now they have little bits of food that you can get there as well. And I know that some people prefer the coffee at Starbucks to McDonald's, so they might as well get a little bit of food from Starbucks while they're there, which increases Starbucks profitability and so on. So if you look at that, you see how these companies are being run. My people that I'm talking to, all four of you out there, that's what I pay attention to. I only pay attention to the price per month of these companies just so that I realize that as an average, I'm paying a fair amount for that can of tuna fish or I'm getting a really good buy for that can of tuna fish, maybe a two for one, or that tuna fish is really expensive and it's like, Christ, I'm only going to buy a can this time. That's how I think about the prices of the companies. And that's what Benjamin Graham was trying to get across to people when he was talking about Mr. Market, is that you, the investor, have to be the one that sets the value in your head. And then that way you can tell what Mr. when Mr. Market is in a bad mood or a good mood. It's nothing more than that. There is no knowledge to be discerned from the up and down price movement of the market. The knowledge has to come firstly from you or from me, figuring out what a company more than likely is worth today reasonably and more than likely what it could be worth in the future reasonably. That's a lot different. There's no understanding to be garnered from the price movement up and down other than like relative value over long periods of time. So all those people that do all the charts, they might as well be painting their faces, half tattoos, sticking bones in their lip and ears. It's all voodoo to me. They might as well be shrinking heads on the TV because... I'm, you, now I'm tuning in. <laughs> because it's just it's just not good. And here's... This, this will warm Chris's heart when I talk about cars in relationship to investing. Okay, before you get yeah. away from that, though, I did have a question. Yeah, man. So, and I'm trying not to make this a, a political as I can. <laughs> You're trying to make it? I'm trying not to make it political. So I'm trying to make this as argumentative as, as I can. As, as <laughs> least the argument, as passive aggressive. So, it, has there ever been a time where something has affected the market so much? Because, like, him tweeting something and then the market kind of reacting afterward is that a that's a new thing, right? Like, because I've never no, heard about it. No, no, it's not new. What's new is the immediacy of it. Oh, okay. Okay. When you would have a big in the past, think of Watergate. Mm -hmm. Watergate basically came to the knowledge of the public via the printed word in the, I think the Washington Post, mm -hmm. right? And and it used to be oh some headline hit the presses and everybody's talking about that mm -hmm. headline today. And that's what's driving oh, the market okay. today. Now it's president Trump tweeted from an outhouse two minutes ago. And now everybody wants to know what came out in that outhouse. So <laughs> are guys on the floor, are they, are they thinking different? Are they always on edge for a tweet or like, do they, they almost, have to have different there's almost, expertise? There's or? almost no guys on the floor anymore. Oh, okay. It's a lot computer. And so you have... So trading places is is history? Kind is that, of. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, kind of in certain ways. Now, trading places was the commodities pit. Oh, okay. And that still might exist. Okay? Right. I really don't know because I don't deal in commodities. So you have a lot of people. It gets a little bit worse now, I believe, 
because people are a little bit more removed from the common drudgery and common sense of life. And what I mean by that is, is that it's more convenient to follow Google Maps when you're driving someplace. Oh, okay. But you're less cognitively aware of getting there and getting back because you're just kind of mindly taking directions. I mean, I think mm-hmm. most of us of a certain age might know the difference between somebody in the riding in the car and telling you to turn here and turn there. You almost have to pay attention more when you're getting the directions of the person so you can get there again. Oh, okay. Because they were you're kind, looking around. Because they were kind of doing the thinking for you, and, oh, I'll turn here because they said turn here, and Chris said turn here and turn There's there. There's that big fruit stand. I remember yeah, I got to yeah, get yeah. off the highway here. Yeah, yeah. So you, people are less cognitively aware of those things, and I think the more convenient that a human being's life becomes and the less that the human being has to think about little daily activities the more neurotic the human being becomes because your brain can only think about one thing at a time. So if you're thinking about driving, well, at least you're not thinking about your statement going down. If you're thinking about, you know, vacuuming the house, well, then you're at least thinking about vacuuming and not thinking about your statement. Okay, your investment's going down. If you start removing all of these little daily activities. I've got a Roomba, I've got Google Maps. Think of how people, how much people are texting in their cars. And they're not paying attention. Well, we obviously know that they're not driving, that they're texting. And I would admit, I would venture a guess that 98% of the time the texting is not factual, it's emotional. So I would think that people would become more emotional as time goes by. And the, the, the thing of it is, is that they would maybe feel more... Uh, isolated because they're having these conversations, not even with the benefit of voice inflection. Not They're not talking on the phone. Mm. Talking on the phone would be something different. They're texting. So they might even feel a little bit more isolated. So me thinking of myself, if I feel isolated on all that, I think a person that feels isolated, that has more time to focus on emotional things during the day, will become more emotional. Won't become, they'll become less stable in emotional events, not more stable. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that that bodes well for a person that's investing because like I've said before, it's the person's emotional behavior that 90% of the time undoes a plan. And a lot of times where I'm guilty of this in kind of a weird way is I will assume that a client working with me over the years is fully well aware of what's going on and how much money I've made them. And that is a really bad assumption. It's one of the places that I'm trying to improve in my practice is to try to communicate to my clients more often so they realize how much money that they're making. Because if they're emotional about their money and they think that a downturn is affecting them worse than it is, they're they're going to be just as emotional on the upside and they probably don't realize a lot of times the money that they've made. Oh, okay. You see what I mean? Yeah. And that's where one of the mistakes I've come in uh, that I've realized how I behave and how I interact with clients is I assume if I've produced and things have gone up and they know how I think that they're good to go. And again, it's a bad assumption, not because anybody's bad out there. It's just because we are all human. And so I've got to remember that to, just to treat in a weird way, treat every single human being in my practice like they have a nine-month memory and, you know, yeah. top, no, up, top up that memory. That's one mm-hmm. of the things that I'm actually going to be starting to uh, uh, starting to engage more next week, actually. The, the, the slow week of the 4th of July I thought would be a good time. Oh, so, so you're going to be doing three-hour seminars about it? Yeah, yeah. D- uh, no, two, two hours, 45 minutes, a little bit less. Oh, okay, yeah. a slight intermission. <laughs> yeah. So uh, one thing I wanted to, how many, how many minutes do we have left? Uh, let's say so, 10. 10, okay, that's pretty good. So here's another, uh, and by the way, if you're listening now, you can take a deep breath because this is going to be easier to listen to. It's not going to be as heavy. But it's an analogy that I came up with because while Chris was driving over to the house this morning, I'm thinking, what, how can I make this my own? How can I make this a little bit different than anybody else in the world would talk about? And I thought, aha, I've got it. When I go look at cars, <laughs> sorry, what? 
<laughs> well, Chris Ab automatically now is reading, reaching for a drink of his monster drink. Man, if there was a cigarette a there, you would have just lit it up, and it's like, oh god, here we go. If you Lean were back in if my you chair, were, if you were a cowboy, you just would have reached back into that hip pocket for that little bit of Copenhagen. Yep. I'm going to need some nicotine for this. <laughs> So when I go look at cars to purchase or evaluate or just to dream about, when a car has new paint on it, a lot of people love that, and I don't. Because unless I know who painted it, there are a multitude of sins that are hidden by a new paint job. And if the paint job's really new, if we're talking months old, it's a, like, a, unless I have documentation that that paint job took the better part of a year or a half of a year, or if there was a big crew working on it, let's say three months to do it, I don't want anything to do with it. Because the vast majority of the people, even car people out there, don't realize the effort that it takes to get a paint job worthy and have it be lasting. So many things, so many different ways in the prep process. Most folks don't realize that when a car leaves the factory, it's got some, it's got an, uh, like, for lack of a better way to say it, uh, say it easily, like an electrolysis coat to the metal, to where if we go out, grind a piece of metal with sandpaper, it will rust in a day. If we take the paint off of a car in a more gentle way, like say by chemical process and we don't sand it, it will still have the anti-rust coating on it from the factory. And that's a big deal. So that's the very first level. I wonder if they sandblasted it and got rid of all of that, which I guess is okay if you're going to prime it within eight hours. So did they, th this is how mm. neurotic it is. It's, oh my God, they stripped the paint. Did they have primer on it within eight hours? Or is there is there a huge amount of the rust virus all over this car that won't show up for like seven years? And if it starts from there, then what kind of what kind of products did they use? Did they just did they just, you know, basically fill in a little bit of rust, like put a little bit of plaster Paris over it, sand it smooth and paint it? Or did they actually take the time to cut the rust out? form a new patch panel, weld it in properly, seal the back, seal the front. Do you see what I'm talking about? I think basically after they paint the car, you need to not look at the paint every day worrying if it goes up or down. I think you need to wait seven years <laughs> yeah. and then go back. I was and... just going to say, now if the car was restored a decade ago, I'm cool with that. Because in a decade... Because then it's had time. Yeah. yeah. Stuff, again, it's usually a four-letter word, stuff will show up. <laughs> I don't know why you're cleaning it, cleaning it up. Well, today. just because it, yeah, I think because it's kind of sometimes implied is more fun than hearing oh, okay. it out there. Yeah. Okay, so, Reno nine one one. I get it. So stuff is going to show up after a decade. So that's what I think about. So if there's a door ding or so in the car, or if the paint's a teeny bit wore out, I'm okay with that because I can see what the reality is, and I guess my analogy was is how most people how most people approach investing. They think when their statement is going up that things are automatically good, and when they see their statement going down, things are automatically bad. If you were to string that into month by month for five years in a row, then I would agree. Yeah, if your statement went down the majority of the time for five years, that's bad. And if it went up the majority of the time for five years, that's good. But people don't think in five-year increments. And it's the same way people paint cars. They don't paint cars for the ne for the third owner down the way. They paint the car for the next 30 minutes so they can roll it across Barrett Jackson's floor, get their money, and laugh all the way to the bank like the three little pigs selling, you know, crappy houses until they build the brick one, you know. I'm doing the Warner Brothers yeah. issue of that. Yeah, yeah. They look just the, patch it up look just at that, enough. Look at that stupid rabbit that bought that straw house. What a maroon, you know. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's... And that's what people do with investing. They they just want it to be good for that 45 minutes that they're having an emotional time, and then they won't think about it ever again. And the people that typically paint cars, they just want it to look good to make that transaction. Then they'll never think about it again. 
And if it's a car that's worth painting, well, then, it, in my opinion, it's a car that's worth thinking about the third owner down the way. Because if you're putting that much love and care into it, unless it gets totaled, there's going to be two or three or four other caretakers of that car down the way. You know, I, with you, it would be like a rare collectible, whatever mm-hmm. that would yeah. be. You know, you know that that collectible, unless it gets broken, is going to outlive you. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not pretty to think about, but, but it's... did the previous collector, did he smoke? Did he have it in a room yeah, oh, where yeah, yeah. he had dogs? And, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's lots of things to think Same about. Same thing with the car. Did he smoke? Did they have dogs in the car? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What's yeah. the back seat like? <laughs> Is he gross? Is there stiletto heel marks in the uh, headliner? You know, Is there a... nacho chips on the floor? <laughs> I, do you see some of the cars where you literally think there's something on fire inside the car because they're vaping so, you know, oh, yeah. so aggressively? Yeah. They crack the window down, all of a sudden you see like a smoke signal coming out of yeah. both windows. I blame 80s movies <laughs> because this generation kind of like, I just want to walk through a cloud of smoke all the time. <laughs> I desperately want to go to one of those cars break into it when they're not there, like get myself into the car and take a very small, nice paper towel of Windex and clean just a few little spots of the window that they could actually see through because a lot of that, when they're smoking that heavily in the car, it's so hazy in there. It's like their own window tinting. Oh, yeah. And I'd want to do like a little porthole, like in the driver's side window. It's like, what the hell? How come that bright light's so bright from that spot? Oh, it's actually clean. Really, because my first thought was, you just want to take it and write like a four-letter word, and then you, and then. <laughs> so when they vape, it appears. <laughs> no, but that would be great. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that was my analogy that I was trying to make a little bit more uh, easy for you to understand that. Most people, when they see a shiny car, they see a shiny car. Me, when I see a shiny car, if it's for sale, sometimes there's problems. There's a lot of problems in my head. I would rather see some blemishes so I know everything's real than see everything just so perfectly, you know. And oh yeah, we restored it. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I'm just I'm very skeptical that way, and that's the way that I invest. I invest for the long haul. I do not try to invest for uh, trying to make a client happy in the next nine months. Anyway, we've talked about lots of companies on this podcast. You know, the Costco name came up, Walmart, McDonald's, Fred Meyer, I think, a whole bunch of them, Starbucks. So when I mention those names, it's just for discussion purposes only. It's not a solicitation to buy or sell. If you listening to this podcast think it is a solicitation to buy or sell, you might be an idiot because it's not we're just discussing it and so on we didn't discuss any relative value and so on and so forth anything else from you if you invest in something that we talked about while laughing (laughs) i'm going to come to your house with a tack hammer and hit you in the head (laughs) yeah exactly so anyway thanks for listening we hope that the show was good we hope that it was brief and now that you can get on with your day and feel enlightened right yeah okay sure okay we'll be back again next time Opinions expressed here are given in good faith and are subject to change without notice and are correct only on the stated date of issue. Past performance is not always indicative of future results. This material is not intended as an offer or solicitation for the purchase or sale of any security or other financial instrument. Security financial instruments or strategies mentioned may not be suitable for all investors. Prices, values, or income from any investment mentioned in this report may fall against the interest of the investor and the investor may get back less than the amount invested. This material does not take into account your particular investment objectives, financial situation, or needs and is not intended as a recommendation of particular securities, financial instruments, or strategies to you. Before acting on any recommendation on this material, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and, if necessary, seek professional advice.